All right, well, let's hear what he's got to say. He got a standing ovation on the way in. He'll no doubt get one on the way out well, too. Morning, here is Nigel Farage, leader of UKIP. And thank you for that warm reception. Um, I have to say, um, I thought the day after the general election uh, that I would not be addressing the UKIP party conference this year as leader. Um, as I'd stood down and I thought that perhaps my life was going to become quieter and simpler and easier. Uh, but it was because of the overwhelming response I had uh, from you, the members, the candidates, the National Executive Committee of the party, and one or two wise people saying, Nigel, if you've spent more than 20 years preparing for an in-out referendum, perhaps you'd better lead UKIP into the campaign. And so I'm here. The In a sense, the general election ended two and a half years of non-stop, remarkable campaigning. It really all began with the Eastleigh by-election, where we stunned everybody coming from nowhere to getting 29% of the vote. It led in to those English county council elections, where we got 23% of the vote in all those English counties. It led on to the European elections in 2014, where we achieved 4.4 million votes and we came first across the United Kingdom. And it led on, and it led on to the remarkable victory in the Clacton by-election from Douglas Carswell. And it led, of course, to Mark Reckless appearing on this stage last year and winning the Rochester by-election. We'd had an amazing run. But the general election, in many ways, was a whole different ballgame, up against parties that were bigger, stronger, and better funded than we were. And goodness knows we tried. We tried to broaden out the arguments. I tried in those debates, those TV leaders' debates, to point out that far from this government having been prudent with our money, actually, George Osborne, in the space of five years, had doubled the national debt. He'd increased our debt by more than the Labour Party had managed in 13 years. I mean, that takes some doing, doesn't it? <laughs> we tried to point out that selection and education would close the ever-widening class gap in this country. We tried to make the arguments that Britain's armed forces are seriously under-resourced. We tried to do those things, but in many ways, it was difficult to get those arguments through. There are times in elections, there are times in life where whatever you do, you cannot change the cards that are dealt. And actually, what decided this election was a big swing to the Conservatives for, for fear of that woman north of the border. <laughs> and, and that Ed Miliband wasn't really up to being Prime Minister. So there was nothing we could really do about that. But the one argument that I did make, and we all made, in the general election, and in some ways we got criticized for. Now, the one argument we did make was that open door immigration as a result of our membership of the European Union is a wholly, thoroughly irresponsible thing to do. And how on earth can any government at local or national level plan for school provision, plan for health provision, if you don't know in a couple of years' time, within the nearest couple of million, how many people will actually be living in the country? And we made those arguments. And we made the argument. We made the argument that immigration can be a good thing for Britain, but that what we want is not an open door to cheap, unskilled labor. What we want is an Australian-style point system so that we can decide the, quali the quality and quantity of who comes to Britain. Well, I was told I was told that I'd put too much emphasis on this, that we should talk about other things that people are really concerned about. Well, I did try nine days before the general election in a speech in the European Parliament in Strasbourg to point out that Mr. Juncker's implementation of the EU common asylum policy would lead to an exodus of biblical proportions. No one noticed what I said at the time, but I think the events have proved me to be right.
And now, and now over the course, and, and over the course of a summer, 15 point rise in the number of people who think immigration and open borders are the number one issue in British politics. 50% of people now put that at number one with the economy trailing behind at 27%. I would argue to you that we were right to campaign on that issue, that we do actually own that issue, that the British public believe us on that issue. Now look, whichever way you look at this, if you'd said to me a year ago, there'd be a big swing to the Conservatives for fear of the SNP. If you said to me there'd be a Conservative majority government, I wouldn't have believed you. But if you'd said, despite all of that, UKIP would still get four million votes in a British general election, frankly, I would have bitten your arm off, and I think we can hold our heads held high and be proud of what we achieved. I really do. The fact that it only led to one seat in Westminster uh, says that the system is crying out and we need electoral reform in Britain, though I suspect at the moment we should not hold our breath. But one really good thing, one really amazingly brilliant thing did come out of the general election and that is that we are going to have an in-out referendum on our membership of the European Union, and that would never have happened without the collective efforts of everybody in UKIP. <laughs> now, now, there's been some considerable fallout from the general election, quite an aftermath, particularly in the case of the Labour Party. Now, the great myth uh, that the commentary had have talked about for years is that UKIP would hurt the Conservative vote and therefore lead to a Labour government. And what we saw, and particularly in the Midlands and the North, what we saw was UKIP tearing great big chunks out of that Labour vote. We hurt the Labour Party far more than we hurt the Conservative Party. And they they very quickly entered into a quite remarkable leadership election which has resulted in Jeremy Corbyn becoming the leader of the Labour Party. Now, it was put about the day that he was elected by Diane Abbott, I think. <laughs> well, she should not. I know, anyway. <laughs> It was put about by Diane Abbott that Jeremy being in charge of a Labour Party would mean that all of those voters who deserted Labour and gone to UKIP would come back. <laughs> well, let's have a little examination of that, shall we? Do you honestly think that Labour voters that came to UKIP in Doncaster agree with Mr Corbyn that we should get rid of the Queen? No. Do you honestly think that Labour voters in Doncaster who came to UKIP would approve of a man who cozied up to the likes of Gerry Adams and Martin McGuinness? No. Do you honestly think that Labour voters in Doncaster would think that it was a good idea for us to hand the Falkland Islands over to Argentina? No. Do you honestly think that people in, in, in Doncaster who switched to UKIP think that it's right and appropriate that at a service in St Paul's Cathedral to mark the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Britain, a room in which there were, perhaps for the last ever time, gathered together significant numbers of men and women in their 90s who were part of that great battle, that it was right to turn up without your top buttoned and up and not to sing the national anthem? No. I think on all of those reasons, on all of those reasons, Corbyn is a thousand miles away from those Labour voters that have come to UKIP. But there was perhaps just one area on which he could have held on to a lot more Labour votes and maybe even tempted one or two back despite everything else. And it was that for 40 years we'd understood that Jeremy Corbyn, this man, remember, of great principle, <laughs> that Jeremy Corbyn, having been a, you know, an, an, an avowed admirer of Tony Benn and Michael Foote, 
that Jeremy Corbyn was opposed to Britain being a member of the European Union because he believed that it damaged us as a nation-state democracy. And so there was, there was room to believe that Corbyn would stick to his beliefs. And yet, within a week of being in charge of a Labour Party that has now become completely, obsessively Europhile in every way, and under pressure from his shadow cabinet and under pressure from his backbenches, he has capitulated on that great issue of principle, and he has said he will support Britain remaining in the European Union regardless of what Mr. Cameron comes back with. And I now think, I now think and believe that a whole new flank of the Labour vote in the Midlands and the North and Wales and right across this country, I believe that a whole new flank of the Labour vote is there for UKIP. I think Corbyn is a gift to UKIP. And what of us? And what of UKIP? Well, after every election, commentators are pleased to say that UKIP's gone and the bubble has burst and everything else. But how's UKIP five months on? Well, let me tell you, five months on, UKIP is not only alive and well, not only alive and kicking, but is up in the opinion polls from where it was in the general election back in May. That we, that we as a party are now massively increasing our reach and our support on social media. We're getting many more young people supporting us. UKIP is getting ready and preparing. And next year, in May of next year, we will fight elections. We'll fight the police and crime commissioner elections. We'll fight the local elections that take place in England. But we'll also fight the elections in Scotland, in Northern Ireland. We'll fight the elections in Wales, and we'll fight the elections in London. And in all four of those big elections, there is a fundamental difference between them and the general election, and it's called proportional representation. And, <laughs> and I think... I think UKIP will significantly increase its elected representation in this country, in those elections, and we will maintain our position as the only UK party with elected representation in all four corners of the United Kingdom. So electorally, that's our big challenge for May of next year. But I have to say to you, as the leader of this party, as somebody who's given over 20 years of his life to helping build this party, whilst of course I want us to do well as a party and to succeed in those elections, there is something that is actually dearer to my heart than party politics, even if it's UKIP. I want us to summon every resource of energy that we can find in our bodies and our minds. I want us to dedicate ourselves wholly to winning that referendum and breaking the link with political union with Europe. And that And that's a message we must send out to other activists and councillors and MPs and MEPs in the other political parties. This is the moment to put country before party. This is a once, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to get back the independence and self-government of this nation. Our message is clear. We want our country back. Now, so there are, really, there are really three sides to this referendum campaign, and I'll go through them one by one. There's the in-campaign, and we know who they are. It's Sir Richard Branson. It's... Oh, I've got better than that coming, don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's Tony Blair. <laughs> and top of the billing, it's Peter Mandelson. <laughs> so we've got, we've got the side that will campaign for us to remain. We've got the side who will campaign for us to leave. And I'll talk more about that in the course of this speech. And then we've got the Prime Minister. <laughs> or should I call him, in this context, Piggy in the middle? <laughs> well, I enjoyed it anyway. <clears throat> now, there are some, there are some in the wake of the general election, there are some, as I would call them, soft Eurosceptics who have suggested that our best policy is to stand still, to let Dave do the renegotiation, to see what he comes back with and then to make our minds up. There are even some in the soft Eurosceptics who think we should be pushing for a two-referendum strategy, that we should vote to leave in order to renegotiate a better deal. And my message to those people is you are fundamentally wrong. Firstly, this needs to be straightforward and simple. And for the first time ever on a UKIP platform, I'm going to thank the Electoral Commission for once for doing their job and for making sure that Cameron's attempt to stitch up the referendum question has been unraveled. Thank you, Electoral <laughs> Commission. But to wait would be a terrible, terrible mistake. It would be to play into the hands of the Prime Minister so that he could set the terms, as he's done, of the renegotiation. And unchallenged, he would set his own bar and he would come back to Brussels crying a great victory in the renegotiations. And by the time the Leave side had mobilized, effectively, the referendum would be over. Because make no mistake, those that want us to stay in the European Union, and I'm talking about most of our political class, I'm talking about many of the giant corporate business interests. They're out there campaigning every day. You know, we see Branson on the Mars show. Ken Clark, I think, has appeared more on television in the last five months than the previous 40 years. I mean, they're, I mean, they're out there. They're out there and they're campaigning hard. And we know they'll campaign hard. And we'll know, we know they'll be well funded. But we have to explain to people that if you vote to stay in the European Union, you're not voting to stay in the Union as it now is. Just listen to what Blair, Mandelson, Branson and the others say when they're asked, do you think we should join the Euro? They say yes when the time is right. Ask them, do you think we should be part of a European army? And they say, well, we think increased military cooperation in Europe would be good. Ask them, should we take Mr. Juncker, or should I say Chancellor Merkel's quotas. And they say, yes, we should be fully signed up to an EU common asylum, and ultimately, from next year, an EU common immigration policy. If you vote, if we as a country vote to remain in this union, we are not voting for the status quo. We are not voting for where we are now. We are voting to remain part of an integrationist project. And that, I think we have to point out, and we have to unpick the Prime Minister's so-called renegotiation. He isn't asking for anything substantial at all. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. He isn't asking. He isn't asking for us to get back control over open borders and the free movement of people to nearly half a billion. He isn't asking for us to get back the supremacy of British law in our own parliament and indeed that our own Supreme Court should be supreme. He isn't even asking that our membership fee of 55 million pounds a day should be reduced. And he certainly isn't asking for anything that the British public in a full debate would want to have. Indeed, 
if this referendum was about whether Britain was to join the European Union, we would look at the crisis in the Mediterranean that has been so, so appallingly mishandled. We would look at the way, through failed policy, we have encouraged families and young men to go into the hands of the criminal traffickers, leading to so much misery. We would look at the Eurozone, where now, if the Greeks have a general election and decide a course of policy, they can be overridden. We'd look at the whole thing and we'd say, no, we're not going to join. And so what we have to do is we have to explain to people that the risk of voting to remain in this union is far greater than the risk of voting to take back control of our laws and our borders and our own lives. Let's make the positive argument. Let's make the positive argument. Let's make the positive argument for trade with Europe, for cooperation with Europe, for being good next door neighbors with Europe. Let's make that argument. But let us, as has been said already this morning, let's talk about the world. Let's talk about Britain's place in the world. Let's talk about who we are as a people. You know, surely, surely we should be able and capable to negotiate our own trade deals on the world stage. And yet, and yet, when I had that debate, those two debates, in fact, with Nick Clegg last year, and thank you, Nick, for giving me that fantastic opportunity. <laughs> but when, when I had those debates, there was a point at which Clegg said, we need to be in the European Union because only by being an EU member do we have clout on the international stage to make trade deals. And I turned to Nick and I said, Iceland, with a population of 317,000, has just concluded its own trade deal with China. If Iceland is big enough and strong enough to make its own trade deals, I'm damn sure that we are big enough and strong enough to make our own trade deals. And then, and then it came to me. Then it came to me. I understood what Nick Clegg was really saying. I understand what Branson and Blair and Mandelson, I understand what they're all really saying. What they're saying isn't that we're not big enough. What they're saying is we're not good enough. They don't think we're good enough to make our own laws, control our own borders, make our own trade deals, run our own businesses, set our own energy standards, control our own fishing waters, and set uh, the standards for British farming. And to win this referendum, we've got to put out a big positive message. We are patriotic and proud of who we are as a people, as a country. We are proud of those that went before us and sacrificed much so that we could be that free, independent country. And we certainly... And we certainly, we certainly believe that Britain is good enough, that we are good enough to stand on our own two feet and trade with the world. We'll win this with that big, strong, positive message. We really will. We really will. But one of the problems with the Eurosceptic movement in this country is it has been, for all the 25 years that I've been involved with it, it has very often been fractured. It has very often been divided. It has very often been a valid, pertinent, and correct criticism to say that the Eurosceptic groups are all run by egomaniacs, that they, with some exceptions, one hopes, <laughs> that the groups are all run by egomaniacs, that they can never work with each other, that they all hate each other, that they're more concerned with who is top dog on our side of the argument than fighting the enemy. And that, I think, is what is the most significant thing about today's UKIP conference. Yes, we're here as a party getting ready to fight those May elections next year, getting ready to have more electoral success, getting ready to build our base of elected representatives. But 
the single most important and significant thing about this conference is that what I have to say to you is, I am just massively impressed with what Aaron Banks and the men and women around him have done in putting together the non-political party umbrella group of Leave.EU. I'm impressed, I'm impressed. I'm impressed that they're prepared to put their hands in their pockets and that money isn't an issue. I'm impressed that they set up social media platforms that are booming and they're gaining about 7,000 new supporters every single day. But most of all, I'm impressed that the people running it have absolutely no personal political ambition of their own at all. They're doing it because they believe it's the right thing to do. And I, think, and I think that what Leave.eu have done is remarkable because they have managed to get every single one of those groups who is committed to leaving the European Union for the first time ever together under their umbrella. And that is an absolutely fantastic achievement and we should congratulate them for doing it. There's been, there's been speculation about which group would get the official designation for the Leave the EU campaign. But as I see it at the moment, there is only one group that set up an umbrella that is absolutely clear in what it stands for, and that is the Leave.EU campaign. And I say to you today that UKIP will now stand hand in hand with Leave.EU. We will work together as a united force of all the Eurosceptic groups that want to lead the European Union. We are, we are together, we are united, and I believe, I believe that the tide has turned. I think something is changing out there, and I believe we're on course to win the most historic and the most important political victory in any of our lifetimes. Thank you very much indeed, thank you. Good, good. Okay. And Nigel Farage finishes her, his address to the UKIP conference in Doncaster at the racecourse uh, there. Relatively short by party leader standards these days. He spoke for just about uh, half an hour, started a little early and has finished just after uh, 12.30. He immediately began uh, on immigration which is the favourite theme of UKIP, other than leaving Europe. Indeed, they see the two as being intertwined. Uh, he said that he had been the first to warn against an open-door policy. He wanted an Australian point system. He said that they had lost or didn't do well enough in terms of getting more seats at the election because of, quote, that woman from north of the border, by which I assume he means Nicola Sturgeon saying that the Tories had frightened people into going back to the Tories at the prospect of Mr Miliband and Miss Sturgeon uh, working Britain together. There he's uh, taking the applause uh, of uh, the, the crowd there. He said that they own, the UK own the issue of immigration, that he'd predicted an exodus of biblical proportions coming into uh, Europe, leaving the Middle East into Europe, and that's what's happened. He thought that Mr Corbyn, the new Labour leader, was a gift uh, for UKIP. Um, he said UKIP was up in the opinion polls. I must say the latest one I saw had them at about half the vote they got at the general election. And then he talked about the need to fight and to win the referendum uh, to get Britain out of the European Union. He said that much as he loved UKIP, he was dedicated to something even bigger, and that was to winning the referendum. It was more important than UKIP. It was time to put country before party.